Hi everyone, in this video we're going to look at the curved arrow mechanism to explain some of our experimental observations with respect to the electrophilic addition reaction of alkenes. In this particular reaction we're looking at an alkene reacting with a hydrogen halide, an HX acid. Here I'm using HBr. This reaction adds a hydrogen and a halogen to the two carbons of the alkene. We can add them in this manner where the bromine is on the secondary position or we can add them in this manner where the bromine is on the primary position. When we analyze our product mixture in the lab, we find that this is our only product, the secondary alkyl halide. Our primary alkyl halide is not observed. This reaction follows Markovnikov's rule in that the halogen added to the more substituted site and the hydrogen added to the less substituted site. Markovnikov's rule was based only on experimental evidence. Here we're going to explain why the product distribution is what it is based on the mechanism. This reaction is regioselective because one constitutional isomer is produced in excess of the other. What we also know about this reaction is that the chiral center produced here is mixed. We have a mixture of two stereoisomers. We have one with the configuration R and one with the configuration S. These are enantiomers, and they've been produced in equal amounts. Because we produced two stereoisomers in equal amounts, this reaction is not stereoselective. So we'll be able to explain the regioselectivity and lack of stereoselectivity with the curved arrow mechanism. Let's get started on our mechanism. Most organic reactions will involve the combination of nucleophiles and electrophiles. The first step then of predicting a mechanism is to figure out which reactant is the nucleophile and which reactant is the electrophile. A nucleophile is electron rich. Sources of electron density are pi bonds or lone pairs. These can be used to attack electrophiles. Electrophiles are deficient of electrons, so we can look for formal positive charges or partial positive charges as indicated by polar bonds. So which of the two structures, given our definitions, do you believe to be the nucleophile? Will the nucleophile be our alkene or our hydrogen halide. The alkene is our nucleophile. We don't have any polar bonds that indicate partial charges, but we do have this area of high electron density in the carbon-carbon double bond. If we draw out the bond dipoles for our hydrogen halide, we'll find that bromine is going to pull electron density that way because it's more electronegative. So the hydrogen will have a partial positive charge this tells me that the hydrogen then will be our electrophilic site. Nucleophiles attack electrophiles. So the nucleophilic pi bond will attack the hydrogen. Since hydrogen can only have one bond, something's got to give. Bromine is going to gain those electrons. So we follow those arrows and draw what happened. The hydrogen I've kind of indicated how this um, is adding to the end of our chain. And because we took electrons away from this second carbon, it is going to be cationic. We call this a carbocation. The bromine atom had three pairs to start with and has gained a pair of electrons. And with that gain, came a formal negative charge. Now that we have drawn the products of this mechanistic step, we want to ask ourselves the same question again. What is the nucleophile and what is the electrophile? Can anything else happen to get us to a neutral organic product? Given the number of charges here, the answer is yes. We can identify an electrophile and a nucleophile. Can you identify what is the nucleophile in this pair? The bromide ion is the nucleophile. It has that negative charge and lone pairs of electrons. So the nucleophile will attack the electrophile, the electron deficient carbocation. This forms a new bond between carbon and bromine. I'll go ahead and leave off the hydrogen as it's implied by the bond line structure. This is our major product that we observed in the lab. The other way that we can draw this mechanism is by adding the hydrogen to the second position in our carbon chain. 
So the nucleophile attacks the electrophile, and I will get the hydrogen adding to the second carbon, and the cation at the end of the chain. We also have the bromide ion as well. Nucleophiles attack electrophiles. We can show that curved arrow and draw the new bond to the bromine. So we have justified now with a mechanism how these two products can form based on our definitions of nucleophiles and electrophiles. When Markovnikov was working on this chemistry, he didn't know anything about carbocations. He based his observations solely on experimental evidence that he was able to isolate the more substituted alkyl halide in greater quantities than the less substituted alkyl halide. Since then, there has been evidence supporting the formation of these carbocation intermediates in these acidic conditions. The key difference between these two mechanisms is the carbocation intermediate. Here we have a secondary carbocation compared to a primary carbocation. And these two cations differ in their stability. Secondary carbocations are more stable than primary carbocations. This stability comes from the alkyl groups being electron donors. By donating electron density towards that deficient site, it is stabilizing and therefore lower in energy. Reactions tend to proceed through the lowest energy pathway. If we take this reaction mechanism and we plot it on a reaction coordinate diagram, we'll be able to see that really nicely. I've drawn my reactants higher in energy than my products because this reaction overall is exergonic. The bonds that are breaking, pi bonds, are weaker than the bonds that we're making, sigma bonds. So we'll label this as reactants, products, and then anything else is known as an intermediate. We only have one intermediate here. We need to place our intermediate on our graph. Will the intermediate be higher in energy, lower in energy, or somewhere in between with respect to our reactants and products? The carbocation is higher in energy than my reactants. This secondary carbocation intermediate is less stable than my neutral reactants and products because it is deficient of its octet. The octet rule rules here. Anything with less than eight electrons is going to be less stable and therefore more reactive. We cannot isolate this carbocation. It is a high energy intermediate that lasts very briefly during a chemical reaction. So if we connect the dots between our reactants, our intermediates, and products, we would find that we would climb the hill to get to the secondary carbocation, and then step two is product formation. If we compare that to the other carbocation, which was primary, primary carbocations are higher in energy than secondary carbocations. This is due to the fact that alkyl groups are inductive donors. They donate electron density, and that is stabilizing to a site that is deficient of electron density. When we connect this intermediate, we have an even higher hill to climb to get there before we form product. So the rate determining step of this reaction is carbocation formation. The secondary carbocation forms faster, which leads to more of our secondary alkyl halide. This reaction is less selective because the tertiary carbocation is closer in energy to that secondary carbocation. So there's more competition. The hill to climb is not that much higher for a secondary carbocation compared to a tertiary carbocation. And that explains why we get less selectivity for this example here. The final thing that our mechanism needs to account for is this stereochemistry. The fact that these two stereoisomers are produced, bromine adding from the front and bromine adding from the back. How do we explain that these two products were formed in equal amounts? Well, let's look at our intermediate. We have this intermediate carbocation. What is the geometry of this secondary carbocation? There are three domains about that secondary carbocation. We have the hydrogen that wasn't shown and the two alkyl groups. Three electron domains corresponds to a geometry of trigonal planar and an sp2 hybridization. This means that the nucleophile 
the bromide ion, can attack from the back face from behind and give this product, or the bromide ion could attack from the front face and give the other stereoisomer. Because of that planarity, attack from the front or the back is equally probable. And therefore, we get a 50-50 mixture of the two stereoisomers. We have just used mechanism to explain why this reaction is regioselective, where one constitutional isomer is produced in excess of others, as well as why two stereoisomers are produced when the product is chiral. We no longer really need Markovnikov's rule. We know now that the reaction proceeds to the lowest energy intermediate. In this reaction, it is based on carbocation stability. The more stable carbocation will lead us to our major product. Thanks for watching.